Well, first of all, welcome y'all to I don't know how to kitchen move. in Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. Kelly and I moved out here about five and a half years. And I know some of you are there know me and some of you don't. I hope that the people who know me didn't tell the ones I don't how shy I am. Because that would have been ruined the whole thing. Uh, I had been a deacon in the Episcopal Church and, and uh, served at Christ Church, West River. Then I went over and served at All Saints. And while I was serving there, not too long after I was there, Stephanie left, like rather quickly, to go with her husband to Russia or somewhere. And um, I ended up being deacon in charge. That was a, a wonderful experience, but at the same time, I was working full time. And uh, eventually during that period, I started a kitchen store in Annapolis. And several people from All Saints helped me with that. And I brought two friends today to help kind of keep an eye on me, who the people who've been at All Saints might recognize. The first one is Stewie. Stewie is my subdeacon, and he um, used to have an owl, but he retired. And he's there to keep an eye on me to make sure I don't go off track. And if I go off track, since he's nonverbal, uh, the refrigerator is going to start making noise because he's going to hit it. And then the other person is my adopted Aunt Julia Child. And that is a very special picture painted by a rather famous artist musician who those of you at All Saints know, Deborah Watson, probably isn't, be, isn't here because she, uh, she's a gluten-free person as you can see, could see from her video a couple of weeks ago. And this is all about gluten. But Deborah did me a great service. When I was opening my store, I wanted a picture of uh, Julia Child put over the fireplace that was in there and over the mantle. And Deb said she'd do it. And she was doing, going through all of that and painting the picture. And she had an accident. I don't remember what kind of an accident it was, but uh, she was you know, not feeling well, all bumped up and bruised and everything. And she still completed the picture and got it into the store for the grand opening which was a phenomenal effort of love and kindness that I've never really forgotten. It's really uh, been something that meant so much to me and uh, that she went through all that trouble to do that. So Julia's not gonna say anything. She's just here for moral support. However, if you see her frowning, let me know because she's behind me. Today, we're gonna make New York bagels. I guess Kip had mentioned to say a little bit about some of the things I did. I'll talk about the things I've done for the church. After serving there, I became archdeacon for the Diocese of Maryland and traveled with the bishop every other Sunday. Lauren Welch, the archdeacon for training, uh, took the opposite Sundays. And we went anywhere in the state that he went and made sure everything was ready and he didn't lose his glasses. And, you know, everything was carried in in the right place. And so we did that for seven years. I was also in charge of all the military chaplains and things that were involved with the diocese. And lo and behold, after seven years, he traded me for a draft pick to the national church. And Bishop James Magnus, who was responsible for the military and prisons. And when I heard that, I was a little nervous because of my trade, because I wasn't sure which way he was going with me, uh, assigned me to my alma mater, the U.S. Naval Academy as a the Episcopal chaplain because they couldn't get any military Episcopal chaplains to go there. So in addition to working full time, I served as the uh, Episcopal chaplain at the Naval Academy for four years, which was a wonderful thing. And then they got an Episcopal chaplain who was a Naval officer to come in. And so after four years, I decided to come, move down here to South Carolina where I was close to my daughter in Columbia and uh, yet far enough away that she wasn't at my house every day or I went at her house every day and moved down here to Hilton Head, and lo and behold, the only church here was named All Saints. So I worked with someone else. They had lots of retired priests, needless to say, and uh, they had a deacon who'd been there for a while, so I worked with them for four years, and then I finally decided to retire. So here I am now making bagels. How many people like bagels? Everybody? All right. What part of my time when I was working, it was after I left All Saints, but part of the time when I was working at the Naval Academy, I monthly, I spent monthly, made monthly trips to New York because I had an office on Wall Street. 
uh, there was an office there that I had an offset. I had to be there at least once a month. So I really got into New York bagels. And I like bagels. You can tell by looking at them. I don't give them up for, even if I give them up for Lent, they, I still get all these bagel marks. So kept trying bagels everywhere I was. I'd go to the store. Lenders have a great flavor, no texture. The other kinds all have different flavors and different textures, but nothing that met the mark. So I decided I was going to learn how to do that, how to make New York bagels. You know, crusty on the outside, chewy on the inside, wonderful kind of sourdoughy aroma when you eat them. And I had to do that. So today I'm going to show you what I found after a whole bunch of research and a whole bunch of uh, ep uh, trials, good and bad, and finally came down to what I put together for today, what I make every, every couple of weeks. The um, process is lengthy, but it's not difficult. It's lengthy because you got to put it put them in the refrigerator for 12 to 18 hours to get the full effect before you cook them. So the ingredients are simple. First of all is high gluten flour. Uh, I'm glad Debbie's not here to hear that. But high gluten flour is not easy to find. Sometimes you can find it in the grocery store. Uh, Bob's Mills sometimes has it in the grocery store. King Arthur sometimes has it in the grocery store. What I usually do is I take baking flour which is 13% protein. And the protein is what makes it a little more chewy and a little bit uh, browner on the outside. And add two teaspoons of vital wheat gluten. You can usually find that in the grocery store. Hodgson Mill makes it. And uh, two teaspoons for every cup of flour. And I usually put that together. And uh, now I have high gluten flour. What I'm gonna do is, I'll put the stuff in here. I already measured it all out, so I didn't have to wrestle with measuring spoons and things, which get, get me confused and get me distracted. So there's my high gluten flour. The next thing that goes in there is a tablespoon of barley malt. Now you might say, barley malt, not only what is it, why? Barley malt, uh, they call for syrup in the recipe, but I use the powder. You can use the powder as well. What it does is it's the syrup is dark and sticky and about half as sweet as sugar and has a malty flavor. And that gives the New York bagels a special malty flavor, a little sourdoughy effect. So I use the powder. Uh, it also keeps it from the bagel from getting too big so that it gets soft on the inside. Uh, it's also referred to as diastatic malt flour. So here's my tablespoon of Malt flour, just mix it in there, get it out of here. And that's a, a critical piece to make the difference. Two teaspoons of salt, one and a half teaspoons of active dry yeast. Get some water going here. There's one thing that I do that most of the New York bagel maker uh, studies that I looked at don't, and that is, that I add honey, about a quarter cup of honey to my water, and also you'll see later to my boiling water, to give it a little bit of a sweet flavor, because sometimes I need sweet. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just turn a little bit, stick this over here in the, in the mixer, put the dough hook on, this is a dough hook. It's kind of like Captain Hook's can. And uh, put that on because that's particularly for making doughs and bread. Why? Oh, nope. Okay, so I turn that on at the lowest setting and let it kind of mix up for a few minutes while I wait and I get my water warmed up. This calls for one and a quarter cups of water, and I put a quarter cup of honey. And I usually mix that with the water because it keeps it from getting all messed up in the dough. The water's supposed to be about 80 degrees. Well, you know what? When I'm cooking bagels, I'm not in a hurry to put a thermometer in the water and wait for it to get 80 degrees. So I wait till it feels really warm on my hand. First, I'll put the honey in. I'll put a quarter cup of honey in here, a little measuring cup here. Oh, new, cup, new honey thing. So watch out for this magic. 
and let the honey come out. So put a quarter cup of honey in here. There we go. And then I'll put the water in. This is a one and a half cup measuring cup. I stumbled upon this and it turned out perfect for this. So I wanted to get it just for bagel making. That's my bagel making measuring cup. Mix that all together so that it will be nice and smooth when it goes in. And then I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna put it into the mixer while this is going. Now, while that's going, I wanna talk about a couple of things that are really important as far as I'm concerned here. First of all is the mixer. If you make any bread products, you've got to have a mixer. And you've almost got to have a stand mixer if you do it frequently. And you've almost got to have a bread hook, a dough hook, depending on what kind of products you make. I looked at a lot of mixers. Now, this mixer is a KitchenAid. And believe it or not, it belonged to Kelly's mom. And it's probably 50 years old, 40 or 50 years old. And yet, it works wonderfully. KitchenAid is made by Hobart Company and every school cafeteria, every ship, every restaurant, kitchen I've ever been in has a Hobart mixer. They are the top of the line professional mixers and they make KitchenAid. A KitchenAid can be a little bit expensive. They can run from 265 up to 799. The 4.54265 4, one is works fine for everybody. Then there's Hamilton Beach is the next best, and that runs about $99 for a four quart. And then this Cuisinart has one for about $199 that's five quarts. Those are all good mixers. So, you know, whichever one you decide to get, if you decide to get a mixer, uh, they'll work well for you. This just happens to be my favorite. Maybe it's because it's old and I'm old, or because we had Hobart mixers on my submarine and I became kind of partial to them. One of the things that um, when you're mixing the salt in with your mixture and then you're mixing the yeast in with your mixer, make sure you don't use the same teaspoon because the salt will kill the yeast and it'll be a problem uh, with your dough when that happens, it won't rise. So this is gonna to have to actually mix for four, about four minutes on the lower setting, and then it goes on in the higher setting, and it'll mix for another, oh, five minutes. One of the things that's gonna have, I'm gonna do when it stops mixing, I stop mixing it, is I'm gonna take it out, I'm gonna set it on here, and I'm gonna cut it into eight pieces, because this recipe is for eight bagels. One of the things about cutting it is you have to have a good knife. Now I never get it cut in exactly the same size portion, eight four out of eight portions. So the bagels come out different sizes, which is fine with me because then people know I didn't buy them in the grocery store. But knives are important. And I used to sell a lot of knives in my store. And I just wanted to uh, take a second and talk a little bit about good knives because the most dangerous thing in the kitchen is a dull knife. More people get cuts from having dull knives and going ah, 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 trying to cut things or ah, than anything else. When I was had my store, knife manufacturers used to send me knives almost every week I'd get one to try out, you know, to demonstrate whatever. Of course, the best are the Zwilling Hinkles and the Wustoff. And then Japanese knives, there's some Japanese knives that are specialized like Shun. But there are other knives that are out there that are pretty good and that are reasonably priced. One of the things that makes the Wustoff's willing knives so good is the fact that they're a special kind of steel, carbon steel, and sometimes it's even called German steel that they're made with. This is a Hinkles. What the carbon steel does is it, 
it allows, it makes it stronger so the edge will be stronger, but it also makes it soft enough that you can actually sharpen it well and sharpen it to be very sharp. Stainless steel knives, notice how thin this is, very thin compared to this. These are very hard to sharpen because of stainless steel. It doesn't have that chromium component in it. In addition to the chromium component, they have things like, I can't pronounce, okay? <laughs> they have carbon, then they have uh, uh, chromium, and then they have molybdenum and some other things depending on the knife. But the key is you want to get a, a knife that has carbon steel. It's a carbon steel knife. It'll be strong, it'll keep its edge for a long time, and you can sharpen it. I used to sharpen knives at the store. I had an electric sharpener. Uh, I really enjoy sharpening carbon steel knives, never could sharpen a stainless steel knife effectively. No one was ever satisfied. But uh, Chef's Choice makes really good electric knife sharpeners at all levels. Uh, I have a professional one, but they have professional at home, whatever. And they're good for doing serrated knives as well as uh, straight edge knives. The other thing that I really like is, should I have this laid out here? My ceramic knife. It's made by Kyocera. They come in all different kinds of sizes. And they are wonderful for cutting vegetables and breads and things like that. Maybe soft meats, but they advise you don't cut regular firm beef and things like that with it because it's liable to break. Now, one person did from a hotel actually did bring a ceramic knife back to me in the store that had broken because they took something out of the freezer and tried to cut it. And um, I sent it back and they replaced it without any questions, which was really nice. The bad thing about these knives before though, was that you had to send them back to the manufacturer to get them sharpened. So every time my knife would get dull, I'd be mailing it back to Tia Sarah. They didn't charge me any money, but it took a couple of weeks. Well, now there is a new ceramic knife sharpener with a diamond blade available on Amazon. It's called Shenzhen, I think. And it does ceramic knives. And it also does stainless steel knives because of the diamond blade. I've had one for about four years. I've used it many times on my ceramic knives, and it's worked really well. By the way, this is a Santuco knife, which is different than a chef's knife. This is flat, and then it kind of curves a little bit. It's easy to cut vegetables with this, easier than, not easier than a chef's knife if you're a chef, but it makes it a lot easier for me, and I enjoy it, and you can cut, a lot, uh, cut really well with that. So knives are important, and, and again, if you don't at least have one good knife, if you have one good knife, you're all set. You know, a good, a six inch chef knife. My favorite knife, I don't even know who manufactured it, is a six inch chef knife that was sent to me by one of the manufacturers. It's carbon steel, it fits my hand well, and it's really a wonderful knife. And so as I go through this, I'm gonna go ahead and use my, uh, probably use my knife that I don't know what the name of it is to cut my bagels because it's strong and uh, it works really well for me. By the way, that uh, Shenzhen Diamond Knife Sharpener is $34.95 on Amazon, which is a horrendous deal for something that does such a good job as that. I wouldn't do uh, commercial knives on it. I wouldn't use it in the shop except for ceramic. But for any other, it works fine. Does anyone have any questions so far about what we've done? Four real easy ingredients, five. And, um, but the and the process is not hard, but it's time consuming. Yeah, I have a question uh, going way back to the beginning. You okay. said that the high gluten flour is so hard to find. And you, I think you said you use baking flour. Did I miss here? A oh, bread flour, I'm sorry. Bread flour. But, yeah, that's a bread flour. I don't know okay. why I call it baking flour. That's, what, that's what's on the uh, recipe, but okay. If you, make, if you use bread flour, just bread flour, that works, that'll work okay. It just won't get as chewy on the inside. I just trying to push the envelope a little bit here for the demonstration and 
I think we got about another minute. Let me just go and look and see. I'll take my phone and we'll see what we're doing here with the, the mixer. The bread is still a little bit, the dough is still a little bit not together. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a little teeny bit more water, maybe a tablespoon, just to make sure that it comes together in a dough during this last minute or so. A lot of it has to do with where you are, what the humidity is and elevation and things like that. So let me go ahead and do that. One of the things about bagels is that they can, you can get them in all kinds of different sizes and shapes. I mean, everybody's used to the round bagel with a hole in it. Um, I get little ones, tall ones, big ones. Uh, they're all different looking. So one of the biggest challenges I have in doing this, which you'll see in just a moment, is I'm going to be rolling out the bagels, to pull them together and make them into a bagel, round bagel. That for me is the hardest part, actually doing it with my hand. I'm going to grab the dough right now. And pull it out, out of here where it's and I'm gonna put it on the, down here in the counter. So maybe this will help. Okay. So I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna kind of massage it and get it into a shape where I can cut it. It just takes a little while. I get it into a log of sorts. Here's my knife. Here it is. Then I'll cut it in the middle. Half again, half again. That'll give me what I need for my eight bagels. Now, generally this recipe, uh, because of the proportions, doubling it doesn't necessarily uh, make it better or doesn't make 16 bagels that are just as good as the first. I'm rolling this right now into individual balls. They're going to sit for five minutes. And during that five minutes, I'll talk a little bit about what happens when we get them into the refrigerator and why we put them there. But these balls of dough will eventually be rolled out into 11 inch strings. And I won't do all of them, but we'll roll them out into 11 inch strings and then overlap the two ends and roll them out with the palm of our hand to make them uh, so that they are a bagel, a round bagel shape. So I'll put these, get these all rolled up. And we're gonna put them, let them sit for five minutes. All these little five minutes here, 12 hours there, add up to the time of making the bagel. But you can see from here, it's not hard and it's not, the ingredients aren't complex, but, it just takes time to get it all together. Now I had a towel here, here it is. Put a towel over it and let it sit for five minutes. Let me take those five minutes and talk a little bit about the process that happens when you put it into the refrigerator and why that is, makes the huge difference. What happens is when you put it into the refrigerator, it slows down the natural fermentation of the malt and the yeast and things like that. So what's gonna happen is it'll sit there for 12 to 18 hours and we will get slow fermentation called retarding. And it'll go ahead and take the yeast, the flour and the yeast and produce a variety of organic acids like um, lactic acid and acetic acid, which is what you found, find in a sourdough culture that you use when you're making sourdough bread. And it's what gives the sourdough the texture and a lot of the flavor. The malt helps with that a lot too. So that's part of the reason for letting it sit there for that long. And when you get it out, I'll pull this out if I have. I have some that I did last night. You get these little these are risen from when I originally put them in there. Yet the bagels are a little bit risen. 
I'm gonna let it sit out for a few minutes before I boil the water. But while we're talking, I'm gonna do two things. First one is I'm gonna turn my oven to 450, with the rack in the center. And the second one is I have a cast iron Dutch oven here that, oops, over here, cast iron Dutch oven that is sitting here, uh, which will be used to boil the bagels. Cast iron Dutch ovens, in all kinds of people make them. The two that I'm most familiar with, the one that you're probably most familiar with, which you see in all the cooking shows, is Le Cuisette. Made in France, great cast iron Dutch oven, but they cost like $399 for a six or seven quart onion oven. And when I was in my store, I had several different kinds and I have a Le Cuisette. But generally what I use is a Lodge. Lodge makes cast iron Dutch ovens and they sell for $69.99 on Amazon. Lodge is the key cast iron company in the world. So gosh, it's probably been, uh, probably been about 12 years ago, over 13 years ago, that I brought this Dutch oven home and I love it. And we'll look at it later when, when I move over there. So you don't have to spend a ton of money to get a great Dutch oven. And I use this one all the time. It's enamel coated. It's got a beautiful finish on the outside, just like Le Creuset. The only difference is it has a silver knob on the top instead of a knob the same color. So it works really well. So what I'm gonna do is roll, I'm gonna just gonna roll a couple of these out. I'm not gonna roll them all out. What I'm gonna do is roll some of these out. I'll show you how we do that. These balls of dough, uh, if you get them too wet and sticky, they're really hard to deal with. But these are not, these are not quite sticky. Part of the deal with using the, uh, the vital gluten is that it makes the dough so that it doesn't stick to your hands when you're working with it. So what I'm gonna do is take my hand, I'm gonna roll it out here to 11 inches long. Sometimes they start coming apart because the dough has not finished you know, coming together and I'll put a little bit of water on them. And that will help keep it together until I get it out to about 11 inches. You might wonder, how do I know what 11 inches is on this? Well, if you've done this as many times as I have, you get a pretty good idea of what 11 inches is. And that little bit, this is a little less than 11 inches, but now what I'll do with this piece of dough, I'll take it, now overlap it back here, an inch and a half. And I'll kind of, kind of get it all overlapped. And I'll put my fingers through and I'll roll it. And that tries to bring it all together, although this isn't working as well as I'd like. But once you get it in the shape of a bagel, just put it here. And now this one will have, uh, this will have some, cornmeal on it. The cornmeal will help the bagel from sticking. Now there's a way to cheat. What you do is you take the dough, pull it together in the ball, and you stick your thumb through it in the middle. Kind of pull it up on the bottom with your other with your hand and voila, you have a bagel. Now, they're not pretty when they are at this point. They're not even, they can be goofy shape. They can be, look kind of gnarly, but they're not particularly, uh, particularly pretty, but they come out fine. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move over here. Let's see if I can get over here to where my thing is. Okay, I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna take these bagels that I did the other night, as you see, they're not particularly beautiful, a little gnarly. Some of them are small, some are big. And then I'm gonna turn my oven on to 450. And I'm gonna turn my water on to boil. Now, where's my phone? What I have here in my beautiful lodge cast iron 
pan, Dutch oven, is, am I just getting it? I'm trying to see what I'm seeing. I have three inches of water and a little bit of honey. Once it gets boiling, then what I'll do is I will take the bagels and I'll dip them each in there for three minutes. And I'll only do a couple since you don't have to sit here for all the, or for 30 seconds, I'm sorry. I'll just do a couple and uh, go from there. And once that's done, they'll go into the oven. Now what I'm gonna use is I'm gonna use this same pan, which I had before, because I miscalculated on pan usage. I'm gonna put some parchment paper on it. Parchment paper is to keep the pan from uh, the bagels from sticking to the pan. See me here? All right. So, I'm gonna go ahead and cut the parchment paper so it fits on there and the bagels don't stick. Doesn't have to be neat. I'm not doing it for a, a cooking lesson or anything. Just cook it, cut it, and then we're gonna put the bagels on here and bake them. And we're gonna bake them for about 13, 14 minutes. Uh, again, everybody's stoves are different. So what I'm gonna do is uh, put them in the oven. Now I'm not, I have some done, so we won't wait for 13 minutes. But what I'm gonna do is put them in the oven and they'll cook for 13 minutes after I boil them. And when they're done, just let them cool and you got wonderful bagels. Now, what the boiling does is it causes the bagels to do two things. The first one is to give off, to give off some, get rid of some of the uh, fermentation chemicals on the surface of the bagel so that it doesn't get real big. It makes it so that it doesn't expand as much. The second thing that it does is it kind of sets the inside of the bagel, the dough, so that when you put it in the oven, it will come out with that nice chewy texture. Take the bagels and usually I'll put three in here and it'll be boiling uh, to the bubble point. Now I've already put a quarter cup of honey in here, which isn't normal, but I like it because it does two things. It makes any seeds that I want to put on the outside stick well. It gives it a little sweet flavor. What I'll do with these, they'll go right to the bottom when they go in there, usually. What I'll do is I'll let them cook and I'll hold them down for about 30 seconds. And when that 30 seconds is done, what I'll do is I'll take them out and I'll put them over here on a rack to get some of the water off. You see, they get a little gooey. And then if there are any that I want to put seeds on, I'll just put the seeds in a bowl like this. And I will take the bagel when it's still, it's just come out of the water. And I'll dip the bagel in the seeds until we get seeded bagel, sesame bagel. This is black and white sesame seeds. And then that's ready to cook. We'll just put it on the table. Now, a couple things about the seeds. First of all, I like sesame seed bagels, but Kelly, uh, for her, they're a little stressful because there are seeds everywhere in the house when I have sesame seed bagels. When I make them, I get seeds everywhere. When I eat them, I get seeds everywhere. Just, it's like Sesame Street. Seeds everywhere. When I first started making, I don't use, first of all, I only use sesame seeds. You can buy all kinds of bagel seeds and things like that. Um, but there's one seed that I don't use because it gives you a positive drug test. Here we go. Poppy. Poppy seeds, who is that? Oh, you've tried it. Yeah, poppy it, seeds. It's seeds. Kathy. It's Kathy. I'm I know. give you a, um, a positive drug, potentially a positive drug test in, in my world for so long I couldn't do that. So I use sesame seeds. 
I buy sesame seeds in the spice aisle, okay? And it's a, it's a jar that's probably about this big. And it costs like seven or nine dollars, seven fifty. I buy these in the international food aisle. This is happens to be sushi chef. The sesame seeds, just like other sesame seeds, and you can get them in black and white. This large jar is like six dollars or five fifty. So I use these kind of sesame seeds when I make a sesame bagel. Once that's all done and I put this in the oven at 450 for 13 minutes and then start looking, uh, usually it cooks for 14 to 15 minutes, but start looking at 13 minutes to see if it's getting too dark. So here are three bagels. This bagel I made, cooked this morning after going through the same process I showed you. And this is a sesame seed bagel with, with the recipe they have, and this is a plain. This is a bagel, which is, by the way, not bad, but it's a bagel from Sam's. And one of the things about it, aside that it's from huge, it's very bready in here. And for me, I like it to be firmer. Now, what is the number one injury in hospital emergency rooms on Sunday mornings. Bagel cuts. Yeah. So I purchased a bagel cutter so that I wouldn't have that challenge. This is a guillotine bagel cutter. I guess the French in me must be coming out. And this bagel cutter, if I put the bagel in here and I take the guillotine, say a little prayer for the bagel. And I cut it. Now with the fresh bagels, it's a little bit challenging with a guillotine bagel cutter because sometimes they squish down. And this is that beautiful interior texture. It's really, really uh, tight and chewy. And it's got beautiful brown on the outside. Now, another thing you can do if you don't want to get a bagel cutter, and there's several different kinds. If you are gonna cut one, first of all, use a thick mat. Put the bagel in your hand. Take a serrated bread knife. <laughs> so busy trying not to cut my hand. Yeah. So you just turn it as you go. You just see what I mean about the seeds. And where am I going? I guess I've already cut through it. So you just turn it as you go. And as a result, you really don't cut into your hand. You just turn it, cut it, turn it, cut it. And then you got it cut to where you want it. Then all you have to do is reach over. I don't know what you like on your bagels, but you get a little smear of cream cheese. I like that because they always called it a smear in New York. So it makes me feel like I'm really having New York bagels when I say I'm having a smear of cream cheese. Put it on here, take a bite. You can see how chewy it is. And boy, is it good. Back in New York again. That's all I have. Does anyone have any questions I can help you with? I do. This, yes. This is Cindy. Um, so do you put the balls in the freezer? I mean, in the fridge, or do you put the, the shaped bagels in the fridge? The bagel. The bagel. Mm -hmm. OK. You're on cornmeal, so don't stick. Right, OK. When you put them in the fridge. The one step that I didn't cover, when you get them on here, you take plastic, I'll turn this over here, and I'll move this so I can see my, see everybody. You take plastic wrap, and I never, this never, I don't know why I never get it exactly to, uh, to work, but you take plastic wrap, and I have this uh, machine that I bought years ago, because I could get, I'm cheap, I could get plastic wrap at Sam's 300 feet at a time. So I bought this safety wrap machine. And I just pull the plastic wrap off. Ah, it's like what we have at church. Right, exactly. Pull it over. It's a church machine. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Pull it over and then seal them like that and put them in the fridge for the 12 to 18 hours. 
That's where the retarding happens. That's where the flavor happens. That's where the texture happens during that period. So generally you have to make them at between six and eight or nine at night, which takes about when you're just doing it by yourself and trying not to talk through it, it takes about a half an hour. Put them in the fridge. And then the next morning you get up, you let them sit for 20 minutes, you boil them for 30 seconds each, you dip them in seeds if you want, put them on a pan, bake them for 13 minutes and you got fresh bagels. Not hard, just time consuming. That's all I got. Thank you. I've got a bagel over here. I'm just gonna sit here and wait until I can eat it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for your patience. Terry, it was wonderful. Thank you. Well, I hope that it helped. I, I, you know, you say New York bagels, I'll make New York bagels to somebody and they're like, oh my God. You know, and it's like, no, 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 no. This is not a big deal. I'll tell you another funny story while we're still here. Is I have a friend who is Jewish and from Montreal. And I see him at the beach every morning. He lives down on the beach there in uh, Port Royal. And I see him at the beach every morning with his dog. And it's going to be his birthday, his 73rd birthday, which oh, most of my friends and I can appreciate 73rd birthdays. And he said, yeah, I'm going to get, I said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm getting Montreal bagels. They're shipping them down. All right, great. I didn't even know what, I had no idea what a Montreal bagel was. So they ship the bagel down. I mean, they don't ship the bagel down. And I say, hey, Bill, what's the story? And he goes, well, I couldn't ship it down. So I thought this is a perfect opportunity. So what I did was I was able to look up a recipe from Montreal bagel, several recipes. I never look up just one recipe. I know it's the camera that I can't, I'm not talking to you. And I made Montreal bagels. The difference is they have sugar in them. They have a lot more yeast in them. They don't have the malt in them and they rise just like bread. And then you make them up, you cook them. So I make these Montreal bagels and I bring them to his house. Happy birthday, here's your Montreal bagels. Mm. I see him on the beach the next day and he goes, those bagels were really good. But there's a couple little things you need to adjust. So <laughs> thanks, Carrie. Great job. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.